Ja, guten Abend. Uh, I will immediately change the language. Um, welcome to the uh, last Samuel Wiesenthal lecture in this academic year. Um, I welcome a very known professor from Yale University, uh, Caroline Dean. She is professor of history and French at Yale University. As I just told, and there are, she's going to have her lecture, deliver her lecture on one of the central notions of Holocaust studies. I mean, we always try to bring these um, <coughs> uh, very central notions into the fore. It's witness, survivor, and victim. And I just found out that basically in all her publications, these three notions are present. Uh, I just want to remind you on the fate of the victim after the Holocaust. This is one of her publications in the forthcoming book, which is going to be published next year. It's also from the survivor to the activist bearing witness in genocide. Today, she's going to focus on one of these notions. It's the witness. And the title of her uh, lecture is going to be Bearing Witness to Genocide, Revisiting the Eichmann Trial. Caroline, welcome to Vienna, and you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, but my German is just not good enough to speak in German, so I would embarrass myself. So I'll let you embarrass yourselves if your English isn't perfect. I can try to take a question in German if you speak very, very slowly. Um, but otherwise, it, it, I would just uh, make you terribly impatient. Okay, let me just. I put this. Um, excerpt from Peter Weiss's Die Ermittlung on the um, PowerPoint. I don't know if everybody knows it was a very famous play that um, is considered to be the play in Germany, at least, that made the Germans wake up at least early on in 65, 1965 to the, uh, to the Jewish dimension of the Holocaust. And in some way, this poem, uh, it's not really a poem, it's a verse in the play um, is really what, in a nutshell, what I'm going to try to discuss today, uh, which is about the pointlessness of Jewish death, the difficulty of, of understanding the kind of victimization that Jews were subjected to because, and the, the lack of resistance, um, why, that, that people question why, why they didn't resist, and um, and the fact that in the end, the lesson that we seem to have learned is that it will continue. And, and so I'm trying to understand how this got to be common knowledge or common sense, that never again now is an empty slogan. We know genocide will be repeated over and over, regardless of all the, how much we learn. And so this is, this is a historical development. It isn't something that is self-evident at all. So that's what I'm pursuing in this book. But this, this, when I read this, um, again, I thought it was really perfect. So I, I will leave that up for a minute. So by the end of the 20th century, is this OK, the volume? Yeah. Bearing witness to genocide was an increasingly common expression of social solidarity and of protest against the pain of others. The witness to genocide was a pervasive icon of suffering humanity in place of human conscience and the conscience of mankind to symbolize the affront caused by mass violence to human moral sensibilities. And witness to genocide, which first described the survivors of the Holocaust of European Jewry, was and is still often used as a title for books and conferences about the Cambodian and Rwandan genocides, as, as well as for articles in newspapers and museum events. My subject is how the witness to genocide became a central trope of contemporary moral culture. These are some, a variety of recent publications. You, if you just Google witness to genocide, it's, it's endless. Right. This is, there's a whole book series. This is a book series called Bearing Witness, right? Just to, I'm sure you've, again, it has become a self-evident concept that we apply mostly in the case of genocide. Okay. Like witnesses from earlier periods, including abolitionists fighting slavery, 
Jews condemning pogroms, and humanitarians denouncing mass atrocities in the 19th and early 20th centuries, the witness to genocide is a moral witness for whom false testimony is a sacrilege. This witness, this witness symbolizes the culmination of a long-term process through which Western European and American publics came to conceive genocide not only as an unconscionable and reparable form of barbarism, but also as a permanent feature of modern political formations. That is, the witness traces a development in which never again was replaced with the certainty that another genocide will happen sometime, somewhere. But how did this most recent witness take shape? How did this figure, now a ubiquitous and self-evident reference to Western moral imagination, first appear and change over time? The witness icon developed over the course of the last century and emerged in its most recent form only in the 1990s, really, after genocide had become a pervasive reference for state-perpetrated murder. And this chart shows, this is obviously 1960. It shows you, um, this is the Eichmann trial to the early 70s, and then look what happens around 1984. And then we, the consciousness goes up and up until 1999 and begins to decline, but still, it's, it's pretty dramatic. And this is only in English. Okay. The usual discussion of the current witness to genocide assumes that it emerged in the form of the Jewish Holocaust survivor during the 1961-62 trial of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem. In this paper, I want to revisit the Eichmann trial. I do so not to challenge the myriad accounts of the Israeli and broader reception of the trial, including the debate around Hannah Arendt's writings or the assertion that the trial marked the recognition of Jewish survivors for the first time. It did. The survivor, as has so often been argued, became an exemplar of heroic Jewish memory and later an icon in a new Jewish civil religion. Instead, I make three other claims. First, the symbol of the Holocaust survivor, the Holocaust survivor witness, was part of a broader effort to define genocidal massacres distinct from mass death in combat, so distinct from war. It also formulated norms governing 20th century Western moral culture in the shadow of state-sponsored genocide. The Holocaust survivor represented not only the near physical extermination of the Jewish people. That symbol also defined the Nazi camp system as a cultural cesura between past and present. And the genocide of European Jewry was a form of cultural as well as physical annihilation. I should note here that international law did not retain Raphael Lemkin's idea of cultural genocide. It was one of, the, uh, of his concepts. It was the symbol of the Holocaust survivor that represented this dimension of Nazi murderousness. Second, the Eichmann trial rendered the evil of the Holocaust a source of moral consensus in the West. The definition of who is and is not a witness is always linked to a moral consensus around victims whose suffering can be universalized and whose presence no longer inspires guilt and denial. Victims of colonial violence, in spite of genocides against the Herero in Namibia, the Kikuyu in Kenya, or torture in Algeria, have only recently been recognized more generally. Until recently, there was a thin consensus against the suffering they underwent but not against the colonial regimes that persecuted them. Like European reactions to Jewish victims for 25 years after the war, declarations of international human rights, I'm sorry, uh, 20, like the recognition, like European reactions to Jewish victims for 25 years after the war, colonial victim suffering induce guilt and often denial. Declarations of international human rights like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 and the Genocide Convention, in, also in 1948, recognized the historical significance of the Holocaust as a vast exterminatory program, but preserved state sovereignty in national and imperial undertakings. 
making it unlikely genocide would be prosecuted after Nuremberg, at least in the short term. The reckoning with imperialism was motivated later as much by post-colonial violence as by imperialism itself. Eichmann's trial, however, generated a lasting moral consensus about Jewish death, itself belated, extremely fragile, and contested by Holocaust denial. Third, because of the, this moral consensus regarding Jewish victims of the Holocaust, they became symbols of a Western moral conscience. Jewish victims finally facil facilitated Western soul searching about the violence perpetrated against them. They moved from the margins of the Holocaust to become its icons. Their image became shorthand for the moral obligations of Western populations to remedy the suffering of others. In the absence of another witness figure tied to a spe specific event or place, the Holocaust survivor witness remains the point of comparison when genocidal violence is imagined and conveyed. Indeed, the invocation of the Holocaust witness to summon the international community to invest resources or to act boldly has turned the Holocaust um, has turned the Holocaust in the hands of anti-Semites, but also anti-imperialists and anti-racists into an explanation for why other past and present genocides are marginalized or forgotten. In this paper, I ask you simply to believe the, claim, the first claim, that the symbol of the Holocaust survivor is part of a longer history of Western efforts to conceive genocide distinct from combat. This begins in, um, in the interwar period with several trials. To address the second and third claims, I explore how the Eichmann trial rendered the survivor an object of moral consensus by erasing the guilt and ambivalence projected onto the victims. That's, imp that's the important thing. In so doing, it made stigmatized victims blameless, innocent, and worthy of recognition. The trial dignified victims' lives and deaths, especially in the post-trial reception of its import, not only because of what they said or could not say, but because writers and journalists conveyed the terrors of death the survivors on the stand transmitted. The trial developed a narrative about the experience of mass murder that eventually transformed victims' degradation and suffering into a redemptive vision of survival. As a new narrative of human and ecological survival developed in the 1960s and 70s, Holocaust survivors became, became quintessential survivors of catastrophe and witnesses to genocide, especially in the United States. So they're part of a much larger focus on survival and catastrophe, especially after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. How did the Eichmann trial lay the groundwork for transforming survivors into survivors and witnesses into witnesses? The Zionist narrative, the most important at the time, turned the trial into the last stage of an epic struggle to defend the Jewish nation and redeem victim suffering by symbolically rectifying their statelessness. As is also well known, but far less explored, the survivor recounted an unfathomable experience of terror and in the process challenged assumptions about the victims. They were said to have gone like sheep to the slaughter and were a source of shame in Israel and of guilt and indifference elsewhere. The alternative narrative to emerge from the trial then was not only heroism, or at least the heroic memory of the Jewish people and the survival of the, the biblical remnant, but more enduringly, an astonishing new story about the meaning of survival that lifted the taint from victimization. Now, I'm going to assume, I, I've assumed a little bit of knowledge, but I'm going to sort of go through the Eichmann trial a little bit um, in ways that may feel repetitive for some people. The head of the section of the Gestapo responsible for Jewish affairs in 1941 Adolf Eichmann played an important role in organizing transports of Jews to death camps in Eastern Europe. He escaped after the war, but was kidnapped in Argentina by Israeli secret service agents and tried in Jerusalem after a lengthy investigation. 
He was finally sentenced to death and executed on June 1, 1962. In Jerusalem, survivor testimony, this is him, obviously, in the, the, in the famous glass booth. In Jerusalem, survivor testimony actively supplemented the review of a multitude of documents with unusually rich, meaning-conferring narratives that placed victims center stage by transforming Jewish survivors from passive objects, often of contempt, who did not fight back, into human beings constrained by unimaginable terror and despised by an enemy determined to wipe them off the face of the earth. Though Eichmann was under indictment, the witness survivors were forced into a defensive position from the outset. The Attorney General Gideon Hausner famously asked them painful questions about why they had behaved weakly and passively in the face of the Nazi onslaught. The testimonies that recount the pointlessness of resistance or escape punctuate the trial and are among its most harrowing moments. And a lot of these are not known at all or not discussed. And that's part of my emphasis here is that there are famous moments from the trial and I'm only dealing with one of them to create a different narrative. Hausner elicited, the, Hausner the prosecutor, elicited this testimony because he aimed to undermine then pervasive beliefs in Jewish cowardice and complicity, even at the risk of distressing witnesses. He forced survivors to describe the effects of terror, imminent death, the price of resistance, and the power of hope, compelling observers to grapple anew with their feelings that Jews should have put up more of a fight, which were as common in Israel as anywhere else. Hausner's questions about revolt were sometimes indirect, as when he asked why Jews continued to believe they would live in spite of what they knew about extermination camps after 1942. The testimony of Abba Kovner, leader of the Vilna Ghetto, or Vilnius in Lithuania, the leader of the Vilna Ghetto resistance, and also famous for regretting a comment he made about how Jews were led like lambs to the slaughter. That was actually his comment, um, which he later, as I said, regretted. Described a hopeless world in which the illusion of hope prevailed and sealed Jews' fate. The judge asks, at the end of your remarks, you said, between us and the enemy, there was something more. If I understood you correctly, what were you referring to? Witness Kovner. The illusion that we did not all share the same fate, that until the last moment, even if one knew that there was a ponery, that is an execution site, they, would always, they always gave us a spark, this distorted hope that possibly you would be exempt. The frightful illusion produced frightful results of people wanting to prolong the life of some at the expense of others. Only a minority that felt itself possibly less stricken, less misled, less under shock due to its past, its education, and its adherence to certain movements which train people to give, it a, to give a personal example, perhaps only they could cope with it. And it is not evidently a matter of chance from where the people came in every ghetto who formed the fighting nucleus. Perhaps it arose from the fact that they experienced less degradation, that they were less panic-stricken, and they knew better how to live in the ghetto as free men in every respect. Kovner emphasized the theme of hope and its ability to impede resistance. He speculates about the type of people who retain their humanity. They are a small minority, likely Zionists with training, who knew how to manage the degradation and panic from which even they were not free as suggested by his use of the conditional possibility and perhaps in reference to trained people. Whatever his debt to Zionism, the memory of those too weak and too terrorized to fight, he claimed, was what was most engraved in his mind. And he demanded from the judge to be able to tell the story of his most vivid memory, which was a girl being shot that he had not even witnessed but only had been told about. Testimony refashioned survival as a form of extreme and miraculous endurance rather than conventional heroism and as the experience of a devastating and unfathomable loss. The dramatic contrast between received ideas about how human beings might fight and defeat their persecutors and the terror that discouraged all but the most desperate acts of resistance describes the incommensurable gap between the public's presumptions about how people might be expected to act under such circumstances and the survivor's experience. 
trial observers and participants, Elie Wiesel, Hausner himself, Chaim Gouri, Muriel Spark, Hari Mulish, a whole international cast, and many others, figured the inconceivable suffering that haunted most of the witness testimonies by invoking the deathly atmosphere they brought into being. They were not conventional heroes. No one ever talked about their heroism except in one instance, but emissaries of the dead. Indeed, one of the most important dimensions of the trial is the image it formed not of tragic heroism, though they tried, but also of survivors' ties to death and to the dead. Critics later transformed the inconceivable dimension of survivors' experience into a source of superhuman wisdom and universal truths about life and death in the 20th century. Asked first by the attorney general and then by the judge whether he had worked in a Sonderkommando until July 1944, witness Avraham Karazik replied, on July 13, 1944, they liquidated us. Another witness, Dov Freiburg, who had been ordered to carry corpses, recounted how the dead men, at least I believe them to be dead, sat up and asked me, is it still far to go? Riva Yozalevska's testimony was perhaps the most dramatic in this regard, and it, it is known or taught, spoken about. Her testimony was given only one court session after Hausner announced that she had suffered a heart attack and might not be able to appear. She testified the next day. Shot with her family and village, she was left for dead. As she put it, the four angels whom we liken to angels of death shot each one of us separately. She crawled out of the grave covered by blood with nowhere to go. In despair, she sought to dig her way back into the grave, but it rebuffed her efforts. She slept on it for three nights and wandered around for several weeks, surviving because a sympathetic peasant took pity on her and gave her food, after which she joined a group of partisan Jews in the forest. Yozalevska's testimony brought into being the dead and the dying so dramatically that observers imagined her as a repository of cries from the mass grave. So this is a lot, it's about the audience and the, the image they're creating. It's not about the actual testimonies. I mean, it is, of course, to some extent. Her survival was miraculous, they said, but at the same time, she could not live in this impure world because her real home was with the dead. Observers not only asserted that her experience was inconceivable, but tried to imagine her powerlessness and, and subjection, which defied all narratives of heroic redemption. She was not only an Israeli heroine, but an otherworldly presence. She relived her death every day and was too pure to live on earth. And this is important because uh, there, are, there is at least one book that tries to talk about the Eichmann trial as creating what one scholar calls uh, a new form of heroism, which is a problem. It doesn't work for reasons I'm not gonna go into, but this, I think this is what's going on. It's not heroism, it's, a, it's survival. Witnesses do not simply honor an oath to the dead or have a special relation to them, but bring their sacred bond with the deceased into being. Those ghostly survivors take observers on a journey to hell, plunging them into flame, smoke, gas, and death. Israeli journalist Chaim Gori, who attended the trial, used an allusion to Exodus, proclaiming, quote, 111 witnesses. There, there were 111 witnesses who testified, uh, victims. An endless procession now receding from view, sinking and rising in a miasma of blood and smoke. 111 proxies, each taking his or her turn on the witness stand and leading us across the desolate landscape. The witnesses spoke, the audience listened, and the room was transformed into an enormous meeting of the living and dead in which it was sometimes hard distinguish, to distinguish between the two. It was as if the witnesses themselves had summoned the dead, the flames, and the souls into the courtroom. Gori suggested that the witnesses were conduits for the speech of the dead. Survivors not only testified about their experiences, they also appeared to observers as oracles of truth from another world. Some transmitted the voices of the dead in a flat, constrained, and humble delivery, as if self-abnegation would allow their agonized bond with the dead to surface and was a tone better suited to the enormity of the crimes committed against them. Critics interpreted their testimony not only as free of sentimentality, but also as a form of self-surrender, not the usual um, 
conception of, of kind of di dignified testimony. An exercise, it was an exercise in humility from supplicants of the dead. The American writer Martha Gellhorn, very famous uh, American journalist and novelist, covering the Eichmann trial in the Atlantic Monthly, wrote that of all the witnesses, all the witnesses were humble. Nothing had anything much to say about his own life or acts. They were only reporting what they knew because they had seen and heard it, lived through it. They spoke only of others, never of themselves. The living surrendered so that the dead might speak. The living dead, this is the wall of the U United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. The living dead became a powerful image of the survivor. Guri, who noted that one witness looked as if he had just returned from the rail railway platform at Auschwitz, imagined survivors as ghost-like appearances of life and death, as inhabitants of both living and dead worlds. There should be a picture there. This is a pretty, she wore her sunglasses in the entire testimony. And you can see the policeman listening. It's kind of, he's obviously very disturbed. Survivors' seeming ability to walk in the shoes of the dead, to speak on their behalf, turned them into secular oracles whose survival bestowed special knowledge of human degradation and gave their experience a meaning. Julius Margolin, once imprisoned in a Soviet gulag, claimed that when silent, witnesses often appeared as though they were dead while still alive, and noted that their survival was miraculous, that they had been elected by fate. In a 1961 essay on the trial, Elie Wiesel, in despair about Hausner's questions about Jewish resistance, argued that Jews died without a struggle in order not to betray those who had died before them. Knowing themselves abandoned, he said, excluded, rejected by the rest of humanity, their walk to death, as haughty as it was submissive, became an act of lucidity, of protest, and not of acceptance and weakness. Survivors prefer, he continued, not to hurl their defiance at men, this is all a quotation, but to remain silent in a monologue with the dead. Wiesel re represented courageous and dignified Jews marching to their deaths, a very peculiar image, recasting Jewish resistance in keeping with the realities of death camps and portraying Jewish survival and its weight in a new light. The dead set an example for those still alive, demonstrate their courage in the face of abandonment by the world, and show lucidity. In Wiesel's account, not panic or fear. In Wiesel's account, Jewish pride and protest are not or no longer intrinsic in resistance, but in the consciously chosen martyrs, martyrdom of dying quietly without a struggle. In a depiction that some have argued Christianized the narrative of survival and witnessing, Wiesel transformed behavior that the world stigmatized as weakness into a source of unheralded and magnificent strength, into a sign of loyalty to those who died. No longer cause for shame, survivors' stories of suffering recre recreated a world of horror and powerlessness that transformed the trial into a space of communal mourning and a forum for the transmission of terrible truths. Observers who were not survivors experienced testimony as a form of collective witnessing through which they were moved or illuminated. The trial represented a rhetorical erasure of the moral ambivalence that had clung painfully to Jewish survivors of genocide. Again, they had been regarded with suspicion about whether they were really so innocent if they had survived, and they were asked if they fought back or in any way invited their own persecution. By capturing the harrowing nature of their experiences and the utter irrelevance of these questions, the trial restored their dignity. The image of the living dead expressed a relation to the dead that both redeemed and memorialized survivors' meaningless suffering and infused it with cultural significance. In the 1970s, as Terence Desprez wrote in 1977, heroism was no longer reserved for Zionist uprisings, but commensurate now with the sweep of ruin in our time. The survivor became central to perceiving and responding to the horror created not only by the Holocaust, but by genocidal regimes in the late 20th century, and supplanted heroic redemption with the equally redemptive survival. <laughs> 
which better express the unmitigated terror of modern violence and the possibilities of life after death. He and others, like Robert J. Lifton, insisted that survivors had a special relationship to death that constituted the core experience of the 20th century and thus possessed a sacred knowledge essential to human society. And this was what bearing witness was to transmit. So bearing witness to genocide meant to was a call to other humans. They incorporated survivors' inconceivable suffering into the possession of a luminous truth about life beyond the grave. Most important, by virtue of their role now as purveyors of hard truths, survivors became nothing, nothing less than the image of human conscience. They bore witness to the suffering they had endured, this is survivors in general, and insisted on vigilance toward future suffering. Now more than combat veterans, who also had been witnesses, they provided a model of social solidarity based on a burning address to the world, in which the once victim demanded that no one be abandoned to a dreary fate. Bearing witness became a modern secular call to moral imagination and to human conscience in the wake of genocide. Mobilized during the Eichmann trial by survivor testimony, it now transformed survivors into secular saints, free of the taint left by where they had been. This was a tremendous accomplishment, if only because it provided a means of envisioning and empathizing with suffering that had been the source of so much ambivalence, shame, and guilt. If the trial affirmed not only the dignity of all styles of dying, influential writers and journalists later used Guri, Guri's and Wiesel's images of the living dead and survivors' relation to the dead as a source of what Elie Wiesel called the mystery of the Holocaust. The survivor witness's redemption was essential to later Holocaust politics and its assertions of incomparable suffering. Survivors could not be cast in a heroic role Mere survival had never before been a form of heroism, but had to be transformed into one, into heroes, sorry. Survivors could not be heroes without the transformation of survival, that is, into a special form of endurance and knowing, which gave cultural meaning to the distinct experience of genocide. And this is the difference between the combat veteran and the genocide survivor. It's a distinctive kind of knowledge of the human condition. The Holocaust, as many have argued, became a civil religion in the United States and in Western Europe for many reasons. In, in the US, Jews overestimated the force of anti-Semitism. Younger Jews fantasized or were said to fantasize about having been there because they identified with their parents' suffering. In Europe, the religion of the Holocaust was said to have substituted for a lack of adherence to organized Jewish religion or as an empty commemorative ritual, given too much memory. And commemorative rituals evacuated commemoration of substance and substituted cheap sentiment for a real engagement with Jewish death. These arguments have been made and are made again now constantly. All these arguments are important, if occasionally overstated. I want to argue differently that the survivor witnesses sanctification by the late 1970s was not only a late symptom of sometimes empty forms of commemoration, but was originally the condition for a positive non-Jewish as well as public, as well as Jewish public memory of the victims of genocide. And I can talk more about the trial and its diffusion, which I couldn't go into. My argument makes a different claim from assertions that the Eichmann trial showed the world that camp conditions made any res resistance at all a miracle, helped Israelis not to be ashamed of Holocaust victims, conferred moral authority upon survivors, and redeemed victims' memory in the name of the Jewish state, though these things are all true. And I wish to do more than criticize the transformation of survivors into secular saints. In, in the US, at least, that's a, a, a discourse that is very common. And I wish to do more, uh, sorry. Rather, I suggest that these truisms, and I don't know how true they are for you, but they are truisms, at least in the US and to a certain extent elsewhere. These truisms now make sense because the trial told a story about survivors, 
that took a life of its own over time. The story was not only a form of revelation about the torments they had survived, it also constituted their survival as a guarantor of their innocence. It turned them into symbols of intransmissible but unearthly wisdom. Survivors were cast in a heroic role because the trial and its aftermath transformed survival in, again into a special form of endurance and knowing. <laughs> Otherwise, they would have remained victims among others, blameless, perhaps worthy of compassion, or perhaps neglected. They would have been like most of the other millions of non-combatant survivors in the 20th century who merely survived physically but are not particularly heroic for having done so. In conclusion, if there is any lesson to learn from the reception of Holocaust survival, it is no longer that Jewish suffering was finally and belatedly recognized. The history of how Jewish victims were belatedly recognized in the West tells us much more about the social and cultural processes by which some victims and not others are memorialized at all about the necessity of cleansing the most blameless victims of the taint of victimization. Today, sorry. Uh, oh, just a minute. You can see this. That's just illustrative, I must. Today, those who bear witness to genocide, I'm concluding here, are not, of course, um, Jewish witnesses alone. Bearing witness refers increasingly to the moral, legal, psychological, and physical labor of second and third party witnesses, as well as traumatized victims all over the world. It describes the hard work of physicians and journalists in the field, lawyers as well as victims who testify at the International Criminal Court, and even the act of spectators looking at an atrocity photograph, which is a very strange thing. And I, that's, I can talk more about this, about how, the, how this transformation occurred. The Holocaust survivor witness has been replaced by a symbolic global victim in whose name we bear witness. Activists invoke this symbol as a rationale for the work of the court, the International Criminal Court, and humanitarian organizations. The global victim is thus a purely symbolic construction that, unlike the symbol of the Holocaust survivor, refers to no specific time, place, or event. The Holocaust survivor symbolized Western Europeans and Americans' belated discovery of their murderousness and served as a reminder and reflection of that self-recognition. The global victim is also, however, now a haunting reminder of the pervasiveness and inevitability of genocide. It's not about a specific genocide, or doesn't represent a specific genocide, and represents the, the recognition finally conferred now on millions of victims. It represents the ubiquity and self-evidence of mass graves and traumatized survivors, not the shock recognition that they exist. From a Western perspective, the global victim of genocide for whom it is others' responsibility to bear witness symbolizes so many victims' woes and such varied projections about them that it is no longer a referent for a specific event, which is why I think the Holocaust is constantly, as I said in the very beginning, invoked whenever there's a, 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 a perceived genocide elsewhere, as in Bosnia and then later, and it, the Holocaust is constantly invoked as the, the call to arms, as if you need to invoke the Holocaust to ca call attention to another genocide. And this is what I was saying has been latched onto by both the left and the right in different ways to say Jews emphasize the Holocaust too much or there's been an overemphasis on the Holocaust. And I think that's kind of complicated to say that. There, there may be, but that is, and that would be because of the Western construction of the Holocaust, right? Um, that's part of what I'm trying to argue here. Um, okay, so let me repeat that. From a Western perspective, the global victim of genocide, for I'm finishing up, for whom it is others' responsibility to bear witness, symbolizes so many victims' woes and such varied projections about them that it is no longer a referent for a specific event. Rather, the global victim embodies a generic recognition that no one should be targeted for murder, 
as well as the political and cultural understanding built into international institutions that genocide will take place again when a state decides that yet one more group of people are dispensable. The global victim even refers, in recent more populist discourses, to an overstrained and naive Western idealism that has tipped the scale too far in favor of victims. As if victims' demands have exhausted our infinite generosity, as if recognition of their needs were a pie sliced into only so many pieces. The global victim of genocide is now less an embodiment of moral conscience in the West than it is a symbol of an entirely new responsibility for victims that cannot live up to its own promises. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will try to open the floor for a discussion. Then I will start with a question. Okay. To, to kind of, uh, if I understood you correctly, it, uh, the question is um, to that how the the image of the survivor changes from kind of a heroic person to and. Here my problem in a way starts, uh, or my question starts, that you kind of need to make the victim uh, or the survivor, you make the survivor uh, to a hero. Mm -hmm. You transform him. And um, what I think what my question would be is, um, don't we lose something by transforming that? Does it kind of, uh, what the, the notion or the word you never used, I think it was victimization. And, and if there's a difference in your concept of, because I'm afraid that this victimization of the survivor or of the, of the Holocaust survivors is also, also has a danger in it, which, which, which you never addressed, that um, we take away from the survivor, and you have a book, uh, Survival Agency, uh, and we kind of mm, make him a, a Puppet or something. I mean, maybe I'm, 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 mm -hmm. don't use the, the correct word. And you have a book, and it just came to my mind: from the survivor to the activist. Mm -hmm. And this was missing here in a way. When when does the survivor become? This is the next book forthcoming. Maybe it's a mm -hmm. continuation. Uh, and when does the survivor become? Because it, yeah, just just from from here in all these images, the survivor loses its uh, his his or her cap capability to be active. Mm -hmm. And one, what happens? What is the next step in your book? What is the next idea that when, when it transforms into this activism? Mm -hmm. Well, it, let, let me try to be more precise because I, I can see this is the problem of condensing a lot. Um, I think that it's an excellent point. My, my, I was, what I was trying to say is, not, is, is to agree with you, actually. That is, I think that the, what happens is that in order to make the Jewish victims in the Eichmann trial and, and after um, uh, no, 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 uh, blameless, innocent, and in order to recognize them, the interpreters later, not so much at the Eichmann trial, but much later, interpret survivors as heroes. And this is the problem. Survivors are not heroes, obviously, and they are not sacred, right? They, they become heroes in the, it, through survival, which is again a very strange idea that they be that they are not classic tragic heroes in any sense. So I guess the argument that I'm making is that they, they actually that this process of transforming survivors into survivors takes away their agency. So that's what I'm trying to argue. But I'm trying to argue that this is a, a very complicated cultural process. I couldn't go into all of it and still give you detail on the trial. It's a complicated cultural process that so that in order to, have a to develop a moral consensus about victims of genocide um, that is universal, that, that induces us to action, we need to have a sense of victims as completely innocent and, and, and having, having been subjected to crimes that are always undeserved. Now, obviously, conceptually, we assume that everyone has dignity and that crimes are always undeserved. But politically and conceptually, culturally, that's not true, which is why there are differences between victims, right? Why some genocides are responded to and not others. And so I'm, I guess what I'm trying to do is talk about 
the, how the survivors themselves are made into something they are not in order to fulfill the needs, uh, in order to remove the taint of victimization, but also in order to remove the, the denial and, and the guilt that many people feel, uh, felt even in the audience in Israel, in Jerusalem, about the survivors themselves. So, so that's, that's the first thing. I don't know if that mm -hmm. answers your question. And the activists, again, sadly, um, I guess the mm -hmm. argument is that the, what's happened is that the actual victim, that is the survivor, I mean, obviously we don't have any good words because they're all culturally so weighted that we either take away their agency by calling them victims or we make them great you know, they, they used Survivor originally to give themselves agency, and now we've turned them into, you know, saints, right? So it's very hard to get out of this uh, symbolic construction of who they are and look at them. But what has happened is, in, through human rights, in the, since the 70s especially, um, now survivors are, victims are most often spoken for. There's been a transformation and the survivor is no longer at the center of everything. It's everyone else who translates their speech. So lawyers for the criminal court use, invoke a victim, but there's no specific victims. They, they do the Lord's work. I mean, they're doing very, very important work. The question isn't that. Humanitarians have to, they, 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 they um, Everyone in the field is, feels implicated. There's now a whole critique of humanitarianism as complicit in the violence uh, that is often, that they're trying to avoid and, and take care of people from, rescue people from. Anyway, those are complex arguments. So when I say the activists, it's, part, it's a new stage in, in taking agency away from victims through these big bureaucracies and human rights um, institutions. That is a lot of what's happened. Not entirely. Obviously, there's very important work that goes on. But it's to think about them and the problems that, to, to think about a move from first person survivor, a victim that speaks, and an image that, is, that represents our moral conscience, which tells you something already that it's not about them, it's about us, um, to an image of who is the witness now. We talk about the lawyers, the humanitarians, us when we go to photography exhibits, right? When we go to exhibits, we bear witness. I mean, what are we bearing witness to? It means we're, we're not, you know, bearing witness to God, right? We're not, we're just looking at genocide and, and feeling good about it, um, about ourselves. And maybe we're prompted to doing something, maybe not. But I, it's just my, I guess I was interested in who bears witness and why and what does it mean culturally and historically since we take it for granted that that's what we do. And, and it's used. Assist, sorry. No, sorry. Do we no. as historians also take away agency then? Uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, I don't. I, I, I like to think that I'm talking about the process by which agency is taken away rather than doing it, but um, maybe. I hope not. In your argument, yes, but it's. Uh, maybe it's sorry. Uh, it may be a, uh, an effect. Yeah. Eva? One of your colleagues at the U Yale University, Hank Greenspan has the idea that there is no survivor's testimony uh, because uh, testimony is a um, performative um, act and it means that I, as a Holocaust survivor, I cannot have a testimony sitting alone in a room. Uh, testimony means that the testimony has a context that, in that case, the Eichmann trial so my question is whether discussing on a survivor is a good framework to understand the position of uh, a testimony or a witness position. Because uh, as I know, many, many persons from the Eichmann trial uh, had different uh, strategies and agencies to remember and to witness or to take a testimony. Mm. And in the in the, in, the, in the Eichmann trial, of course, they did the, that way you described us. But probably in the, in the synagogue, they used another way to remember and to take uh, testimony. So I, I don't know whether we can uh, frozen, so we can make, make this frozen picture of, uh, of uh, victimization or heroization of a, of a human experience without uh, uh, using this bigger discursive 
framework of the uh, uh, very special act in which the testimony uh, uh, was taken. So I, 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 I don't know the answer, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I, I, I did a lot of uh, uh, interview with, uh, interviews with survivors, mm -hmm. and, and I also had the experience that, that uh, this is a kind of uh, reenactment and uh, my position as, a, as, a, as an interview, interviewer is, is extremely important in this story. So if my question is crazy yeah, or make, make, makes somebody, somebody crazy, then there is no any testimony which will, will uh, be uh, told for me. So this is really a big uh, game. And in your case, I think it's a big uh, political game. And I would understand this type of uh, development, being a survivor, then being victim, and so on. So this long uh, story of uh, finding a way to tell the story, I experienced uh, probably in the bigger uh, political framework of, of uh, giving a testimony. So, but I don't know whether it's... It's Can I ask you a question? Do you mean when you say political framework, do you mean to understand the entire context in which yes. the trial occurs and everything? Yes. Okay, yeah. It, it is so, um, I'm, I'm very sorry, I should have, I, I do that. It's a, hu it's a very long chapter, but that isn't sufficient, obviously, to answer the question. Obviously, the, the Eichmann trial is a very complex trial, and I'm not trying to... Uh, um, extracted from its context. It's obviously a certain moment, and I, I wasn't able enough to, I think, what, what I do much more um, thoroughly uh, is to take the, um, the mediation of these journalists and observers and explain how it's diffused through, in, in, in Western Europe, Germany is exceptional, but in, certainly in the United States and in France, and in, there, there's a reception of the trial, right? So that, that has to be traced, right? Um, to understand what the investments, especially in different national cultures, right? In Israel, it's, it's really about um, trying to get rid of the stigma. It's about Zionism, and it's about trying to get rid of the stigma of passivity. Um, in of the diaspora Jew, right? In the United States, it's just, it, it's all about the recognition of the Jewish dimension of the Holocaust. Similarly in France, but there are also questions about passivity in Germany. There's a lot of ambivalence. It's happening in a particular moment in political life in West, in West Germany, what, then the Federal Republic. Um, so, um, so it, this is a very complex story. I, I understand that. And, I, and it's, it's there, but I, I guess what I was trying to take out of it was, um, and, and I don't want to say, I don't think you're saying that. Are you agreeing with the colleague or no? A bit. Okay. Because he has a big experience. Uh -huh. Well, this is, I think there are two ways of seeing that. And one is you could read the trial as performative, right? Because that's how the symbolic witness is created because they perform this, the survivor, right? They perform, the testimony is performative and therefore creates, you know, that's in the courtroom when people talk about what happened in the courtroom, which was the audience were themselves, full, it was full of survivors. And in the courtroom, there was, it was as if they were mourning together. And so it was this very dramatic scene, which I, I, I you know, it's, it's a huge literature on the Eichmann trial, you know. But um, so, so I guess the, the, so I would say absolutely there should be a political context. I'm sorry if I didn't supply a sufficient amount. You're absolutely right. I guess I don't, what I'm trying to, to get at is um, when you say it's, you know, it's performative, it's only performative, do you mean that we can never hear it in any other fashion? I mean, yeah, I would agree. Yeah, and I'm, I, what, how come that doesn't come out there? Because that's, the, that's why I think, I agree with there are millions of different narratives about what happened in the Holocaust, obviously. And the post-war period, there, there's you know, this idea of silence is mainstream culture. It's not Jewish culture. Everybody's talking about it, sotto voce, right? Um, and there, there are even memorials. The Paris is the site of the first Holocaust memorial, right? Not, not New York, for example. New York is next. Um, so, and, but this is all intracommunal. And, um, and riven by political and religious and, and national differences. So all of that's true, but I'm, and what I'm trying to get at is, is the, how culture made, how a mainstream culture, especially in the West, so two things, made sense of the Holocaust, made sense of the survivor. How did it come to this, right? 
And secondly, um, how, how did they become this symbol, this icon of survival, and how did heroism become survival in the late 20th century? One, and two, I guess I'm really concerned, I hope this, this is the, politi the political, I'm very, very concerned about the way the Holocaust has been appropriated by, especially by populist politicians all over now, um, as somehow, especially in Europe, this is a discourse less so in the States, as somehow, but it is, it, it has a, it ha there is a discourse like this in the States too, has taken over all memory and has blocked out other memories. Now, obviously in Germany and Austria, you know, it's complicated, it's, every national culture is complicated, but, um, but this seems to me, and this is, as I said before, on the right, it's very, very powerful. But on the left, it's also used to say, we can't think about colonialism because the Holocaust is in the way. So my question is, why, what, what's behind that argument? How did it get, right? And this is all about the prominence of the Holocaust as the genocide, right? The genocide. Is, and, and so how did that happen? Because Jews lobbied? I don't think so, all right? So how did that happen? And it happened because of the symbol, the icon of the Holocaust, how the Holocaust survivor was made dignified in this peculiar fashion by a mainstream narrative that was, it took different forms in Western Europe and the United States. And that, does that make more sense? Yes, of course. Okay. I think that I, I can follow your argumentation and uh, also use another uh, American scholar, uh, Jeffrey Alexander, who, to, mm. who gave a talk here two or three years ago in Vienna. And he, he has this provocative thesis that the, that the Holocaust as a trauma, as a cultural trauma, yeah, yeah. could be a progressive uh, uh, um, vehicle of, uh, of modernization or, or a future-oriented uh, social imagination so mm -hmm. so <laughs> yeah I don't agree with that but <laughs> he has a very yeah he has a certain view it's sociology yeah but that's okay I mean thank you well um, my question or my thoughts go in the same direction but from a, a little different angle uh, one thing is one 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 question is um, uh, in um, in the in the early in the early trials, especially in Germany, and we have uh, this horrible movie, this documentation right now here about Mura, the process uh, against an Austrian. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the the image of the victim is uh, the image of the uh, testimonies is quite different because uh, um, um, from the accusation they are. Because they lie, they make uh, uh, they make argumentations which are not congruent with uh, former uh, argumentation and things like this. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, behind this, uh, okay, that that make uh, that has a, a, a cruel sense uh, within these trials. Uh, but uh, behind this, in the early years, there was also this uh, questionable question of uh, object, so-called objectivity. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, and uh, it was questioned that survivors, on one hand, can't be objective, as uh, uh, their memory is always subjective. On the other hand, there was this early uh, critical argument uh, they can't uh, be testimonies because they are too deeply involved into the thing, uh, horrible uh, thought. And later on, then, you have, uh, you have this... Um, book of uh, James Young, where a totally new uh, picture and narrative of testimony is, which includes also imagination and, and even later born or, or persons who didn't uh, ha have been personal testimonies. And my question to this is, uh, how does this perspective go together with your Mm -hmm. angle, which is a different one, and I'm just thinking how are 
these two angles going together? That is question one. Question two is a simple one. How do you deal with Arendt's critique uh, that uh, in the Eichmann trial um, uh, the testimonies were taken? Uh, uh, Many of them were taken, although their cases were not so related to the Eichmann case. It's a totally different thing. And uh, third is a real a question and goes to your question as well, uh, because you are you were talking about the genocide side and how uh, how prominent uh, this genocide is in the discourse. Uh, I mean, what about the singularity thesis? That is that is the base of all. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's. <laughs> I'll, I'll, no, no, it's a lot. Um, I, I, let me take the Arendt thing for the Arendt question because it's um, pretty straightforward. She. I, I don't know. Has any, does everybody know Arendt's book on Arendt in Jerusalem on the Eichmann trial? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Some people won't, but it, it was very controversial. It probably is the lens through which, for at least 20 years, most people understood the Eichmann trial, right? So it's very important for that reason. It's, and then it, and it caused a huge controversy, especially among the Jewish community, because she was seen as blaming Jews for going to their deaths um, like sheep to the slaughter. But um, she was accused of saying a lot of things she didn't say. And the real problem with, with there were, the, I think, I mean, all I would say about that is Arendt, I didn't, ins uh, she, that's, the way to deal with it is say that she was the prism through which people read it. So in fact, some of the discourse uh, about not blaming victims after the late 60s and 70s is a re repudiation of a rent. It's to say, and Bruno Bettelheim and all of these other, um, there was Bettelheim and Viktor Frankl, all these uh, Jewish uh, 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 doc, uh, uh, very complicated people who, um, who basically wrote a lot and they tended, Bethlehem, even though they were complicated and they had some very interesting things to say, tended to blame victims um, in very complex. I would want to jump on this uh, only on her critique. Yeah, but she, yeah, yeah, yeah. But she actually, um, criticized Bethlehem. Yeah. That's why, I guess what I'm saying is she's very complicated because she's not as simple as everybody makes her out to be. At the same time, she did not really know very much, because nobody did, right? Very few people knew very much in 1965. She had read Ralph Hilberg, and she based Eichmann on that, and she, um, she, got the, she blamed the Jewish councils. Now, that is the Judenreiter. Uh, sorry, that was, uh, that was absolutely not my point. My point was uh, that she told there were so many testimonials in, in the Eichmann trial, but many of them, it was her critique, were not as personal cases so related to Eichmann. Oh, but they were shown I'm as, sorry. Oh, yeah, it's the objectivity yeah. question. No, oh. no, not the obje objectivity question, well, the relation question. Yeah. It, it's about the, ju the, the, that is one of the, the, the critiques of the trial is that it wasn't a proper trial, that it was um, a legal retribution, uh, that it was um, vengeance rather than justice. Yeah. And, 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 and my question would be how, how does this critique go together with your thesis of making, uh, changing or transforming the got image it. to heroes? Yeah? Okay, got it. Now I understand. I'm sorry, I, I didn't get that. Um, I, it goes together because I would say that, in fact, the trial, I would defend the trial as have many other people, but I think that, w first of all, in historical perspective, it resembles other trials because when victims had no place to go, often trials, the, 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 the forums that gave victims voices tended to be very irregular because where, where victims would purposely, for political reasons, hijack testimonies. This happened in, in a lot of other cases. Um, obviously, in Germany during the interwar period, this, you know, this can, is not a good thing, all right? But I'm, I guess what I'm saying is that when, that, that the Eichmann trial deliberately said to vic give victims a voice. Now, Arendt didn't believe this. She believed that it was a show trial. And I, 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 Sure, did Gideon Hausner grandstand? Sure. Uh, was it meant for public consumption? Yes. 
did it do something absolutely crucial and important that would never have been done otherwise? I mean, if, if Germany wanted to try Eichmann, they could have, right? But they didn't, nobody wanted to try him. So, um, so at least they did. And that permitted, if without the Eichmann trial, God knows when it would have happened. So I, I, I and, and, and there have been some, some, some lawyers, international lawyers, who have really argued that the actual procedures were carried out to the letter of the law in spite of the fact that they, uh, the victims, the big problem, as you're saying, is that the victims who testified did, were not just victims who actually had contact with Eichmann or suffered directly from what he had did. They were victims who, uh, that, was, that were meant, who were put there for, for, were chosen for pedagogical reasons so that they would talk about various stages of the Holocaust, describe various crimes that were you know, peripherally sometimes related to Eichmann's actual deeds. But the argument made was that the Holocaust had to be understood in its entirety. Um, and that without this kind of testimony, there was no context within which to put Eichmann's crimes. So, okay, so that's, you know, so yeah, I, I, I fully believe in the legitimacy of the trial and I don't know what else would have happened. To objectivity, a similar kind of question. So a rent, you know, she also has a tone in the book. Um, to the question of objectivity, of course. I, I mean, you, 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 that would be putting victims on a pedestal to not hold them to the same standard, exactly. I mean, this is what we don't want to do because then you turn them into saints who, have, who only speak truth and their truths are not transmissible, et cetera, et cetera. So that is, um, that is one, um, and at the same time, in the context of the Eichmann trial, this is the first time most of these people are even telling their stories. And so the, the, in some way, is it an unusual forum for witnessing? Yes, absolutely, and it's performative in every way for that reason. But, um, but is it not objective? I don't think so. I'm yeah. sorry, that is, that's absolutely not my point. Oh, okay. but, but, but that was, uh, that was this uh, horrible uh, historical argumentation, yeah. which, is, uh, which, which, was, which was historically creating another image than your heroic image. And I my see. Oh, question that's why you was, refer to how, the Austrian how trial. Does this, okay. How okay. does this go together with your, uh, with your uh, yeah. thesis, uh, we yeah. have a, a cultural transformation to the, vict uh, to the testimonies the as heroes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that, did that make sense then? Then that, that, that you can see then how that would connect to the, and so on the more, on the young thesis and the moral imagination, all that, yes. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I'd go as far as trauma, um, to say trauma can have a constructive purpose. I, I, I think it's more important to historicize why we think that. Right? That would be my position, is what, why did trauma become a paradigm of knowledge uh, in the late 20th century uh, through trauma theory and, uh, and, and uh, psychoanalysis and a return and, and testimony. Obviously, it has a lot to do with the Holocaust and the, and the centrality of the Holocaust survivor and genocide. Um, but clearly, I'm trying to do a cultural history of, of the moral imagination, I think, at least in regards to this concept of bearing witness. And so you're absolutely right that without, however, giving up on ideas that victims should be objected, you know, held to certain standards or that, you know, we shouldn't evaluate all these things in context with their political resonance and everything taken into consideration, but just try to highlight or illuminate this process of uh, symbolization, as it were, how, how, this, sim how this icon be emerges culturally. And it's hard to do partly if this seems, if I'm having a hard time, you know, it's hard to do because it requires that you talk about a s set of symbols and you read them as if they were, like how do you talk about how a, a symbol has influence and impact when it's just a symbol, right? How do you talk about how it emerges? Uh, historically, from very concrete contexts, it's very hard to put those two together. So the, I'm trying to look at sources people don't look at very often. To I mean, people look at Eichmann all the time, so that was a bad example. But but I but um, and and to how the, those sources help me reread the Eichmann trial a little differently, and that allows you to say some things about the culture of bearing witness that are going to be inadequate in some ways and not in others, but. 
if to to go back to what you said, I'm trying exactly not to take up the celebration of the victim or the survivor, but nevertheless to valorize the victim's voice and to talk about how culture has stripped agency of victims in many ways, but also in the effort, in the very effort to listen to them. So that I think that's the paradox, right? Um, thank you very much for your interesting talk. And um, I think uh, one question I wanted to ask has been asked before, so I'm going to skip that. But I'm um, kind of curious about what you said, what you just now said about this idea of writing the culture of bearing witness. And that's what I wanted to ask you because um, um, I didn't, maybe it's a very pedestrian question, I don't know. Because um, I found your interpretation of this idea of this a new symbol of survivor bearing being a witness bearing testimony and so on very interesting but then you kind of lost me because you kind of implied this idea spreading at some point mm -hmm. and then you just referred to examples which i mostly associate with the united states and more or less in a general way the western world um, and I wanted to ask you if you could maybe just elaborate a little bit on how this idea spread when, you know, what kind of other factors have to be taken into account that this idea of bearing witness today is so much, so important. Because, I don't know, I would probably say that it has to do with other factors, media representations as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. That, I mean... Yeah, I mean, there are even online witnessing platforms now, right, where everybody can witness, and there are whole teams of people that that just watch for video feed from human rights catastrophe areas like Syria to try to to try to verify that something has happened the way that victims or people on the ground say it has. So that, that that's all very important work. I'm not, you know, I, I think that um, that it is Western. And the reason it's Western is because the Holocaust is a Western event. I mean, it, ha it, it obviously it happened in Eastern and Western Europe. It is, and the way that we think about the Holocaust, I think, is in spite of arguments about the global Holocaust, which has been Americanized, which is kind of a cliche now, right? Um, the Holocaust, as a as a image or the, the survivor as an image or an icon or the bearing witness to genocide as a process is a Western emerge out of the experience of the, in the emerge out of the experience of the Holocaust in the West as a form of Western self-reflection and self-criticism, right? And self-congratulation in many ways as well. Um, so it is, that's why the Holocaust survivor becomes a symbol of Western moral conscience, right? Um, and that is part of the problem that the West can't get the Holocaust out of the way in order to recognize other genocides in symbolic terms, okay? Um, and this goes to comparability, as, as you mentioned, which is that these genocides can be very similar. They're always different because they're historically different. But of course the Holocaust needs to be compared with other genocides and everything. So, I, but I'm not sure, I mean, other than media and all that, what, what I, I'm, I'm trying to get to the question where you, where I lost you. So I lost you at the and transition from it, which. Where yeah, it, because we were talking about the political and historical context before. Um, well, if we say Western, if we take a closer look on Austria, for example, and if you have a look at the uh, discussion of the Eichmann trial in Austrian media, it, it's a, as a fellow colleague put it, it's a small disturbance and not an earthquake. Mm -hmm. um, so when does this, even if we're just talking about the so-called Western world and not, not really paying attention to the fact that there are perpetrator societies as Germany and Austria and in other countries within this Western world, when, when does it start? So when does this idea of the special place of the survivor witness, you know, really take root in a juridical discourse, in a political discourse? The 19, 19, late 80s, but especially as I showed, at the 1990s, it's very late. And that's because partly of the, the, if you want to talk about, look, first of all, if you're ever going to write a book, 
And it's not only about a country. You have to generalize a little bit. So you know, you have to know your na- the di- that there are differences in national cultures, and there is no question. It's extremely hard to talk about Germany and Austria for all the reasons you know you've just mentioned, um, because it comes later. But but what's interesting is one of the big problems with the whole critique of memory and the too much memory. It's in France especially, but Germany and Austria, for reasons of a sense of oversaturation, have been one of the biggest, at least in a, a certain kind of mainstream discourse, has uh, on the left has been kind of a certain promoter of this idea of, of, um, of a surfeit of Jewish memory, right? Uh, that, and that's because, you know, this sense of being hit over the head, right, all the time with, with the Holocaust. Uh, the, the moral cudgel, the Walser argument, right, about the moral cudgel. And so I guess if what I do with the Eichmann trial, as I, I was mentioning before, um, is to say, of course, in Germany, it, it, it was also not much of a, it was, it had some effect, but very little. So we know that in Germany, for example, and in Austria, it's even later, though the movie Holocaust is shown in 1979, and that's really when German self-reckoning begins. By the 1990s, this discourse of the survivor as an icon and the, the, with the setting up of the International Criminal Court in 1998, which became operative in 2002, you, you actually have a... Um, you actually have an invocation constantly by the lawyers and judges of the International Criminal Court, um, wherever they're from, of the victim. And, the, fir- the, and the, the, the historical literature suggests that the human rights regime, that there's a direct line from Nuremberg to, to, to the criminal court, right? That's not true <laughs> legally, but that, that's the image. Is somehow the Holocaust is at the birth of modern human rights, and that international criminal law, that's why I mentioned the fact, I'm sorry, it's all buried there. It's, I'm sorry, it's just too condensed. Um, international criminal law punishes physical annihilation, but not cultural annihilation. In order to talk about cultural annihilation, you have to use another category like uh, property theft, right? You can't say, you can't, Lemkin's idea of that, that genocide involves cultural annihilation was not turned into law. So it's extremely difficult to, to even legally address those things. And as we know, the criminal court has been, for all the rhetoric, it's been, it's had a very difficult time convincing perpetrator countries to let their perpetrators get right. I mean, they don't have a cons- they don't have a police force, right? They can't go arrest perpetrators. So um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I, I think that it would be okay, though I understand your objections, to generalize a, at least after the 1990s about um, about a kind of bear, a culture of bearing witness in the West, and to argue historically, as I do in the book, but I couldn't go into here, that it begins in the interwar period and develops, especially in France. Obviously, in France, what is the bear, what is who are the witnesses? The partisans, the wi- the resistance figures, right? In Germany and Austria, obviously, you don't have that. Um, I mean, they take different form. Um, but they're, the witness, I, I understand, it's a problem. But later on, in German and Austrian memory regimes, th- there's a very, very strong emphasis on, on commemoration and bearing witness. So that's why I'm... So are you saying it's not, still not enough? You think it's o- over-exaggerated? Um, no, I just, you know, just wanted you to give me some, you know, um, some moments you know, like some data and some historical background. Uh-huh. What decades you would say this has started to yeah. develop? It's complicated. I'm not but... even trying to argue um, against this. Oh, question. no, 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 it's fine. No, I just wanted to say it's very, yeah, I, I guess I could have given you more. It's clear I could have given more context. I, I, I have to say I'm really sorry. I thought I, I kind of was afraid that if people knew a lot about the Eichmann trial, because it is talked about a lot, especially I, w- I thought in Vienna, Eichmann was in Vienna, you know, that maybe you'd all fall asleep. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to go over it too much again, because I was afraid that, you know, obviously there are some people that won't know, but, and it's important, but I was afraid that there would be people that would have thought the Eichmann trial again, you know, so. So thanks. You're very good. So we love to, to discuss, so it's a really nice discussion. So uh, thank you very much for this uh, inspiring and sometimes provoking thesis.
first of all. Uh, uh, but I'd like to stress that I don't think so that uh, Holocaust is a paradigm, uh, is a Western intervention. Raphael as all genocide is a, is a Western intervention or invention. So uh, I think uh, transnational uh, um, contexts are extremely important. It, for me, uh, uh, it's, it's rather uh, a kind of uh, um, communication between Eastern and Western Europe. How we can deal with our joint past after the Second World War. And if you, if you see this pendulum effect, uh, discussing vic victimhood, discussing heroism, and so on, you will see many similarities uh, in the Western and Eastern part of uh, Europe in the 70s, 60s, 70s, uh, and 80s. And it's really um, remarkable that the differences appeared around the middle of 90s, as you showed. Uh, and uh, we didn't discuss it, but it was the, the Yugoslav War which uh, re-thematized genocide, uh, the evidence of a crime, and so on. So the, the questions, uh, uh, which, which were the questions of, of Lemkin uh, 70 or 18, 80, 80 years ago. So I, I, I don't think so that you, you, we, can, we can understand this story um, just looking to the West or uh, understanding uh, the East because it was a big uh, political game and uh, cultural game uh, uh, and work on, on, the, on the joint uh, horrific pass. And the second point I, I, I wanted to, to stress that Holocaust is a, as a paradigm is, is probably there for uh, so, uh, an extremely successful story. Mm -hmm. And it is because it's trans, trans, uh, transmittable, tra transformative. Uh, so you can transform the, this paradigm uh, to the the understanding of the genocide in, in Rwanda, in, in uh, Cambodia, in, uh, uh, in Bosnia, and so on. And then we have to understand the, the, the horrific position of the victims or the survivors that they were used to this transformation. And the witness testimonies were used to understand. So the, the witness testimonies of the Holocaust are using now in the museums of genocides in many, many small countries and cities. So I think this is the, in German, you can uh, 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 say, a Spannungsfeld of the story. And it's, it's, a, it's a European <coughs> story and not only a Western story, I am, I am sure. Well, that, that, but that, yeah, absolutely. And that is, but that is what I was trying to get at when I said that, um, that the Holocaust dominates this international discourse when it comes to inducing people to act about other, you know, states to act about other genocides. So, for example, as you mentioned in Kigali and Rwanda, there's a whole room devoted to Auschwitz, right? Which, and that's. Pardon? Yeah. Yes, yes. And, and so the, the, I think it's really, really important. So yes, it's been globalized, but that, that's, I think it's, it's very interesting because I, I think that it is, what I find fascinating is that in spite of the global, that the Holocaust remains a dominant paradigm, not only because it's malleable and so it can be applied, but the fact that it's the symbol of the way that the Jewish gen the Jew genocide of European Jewry is conceptualized is so powerful that it 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 can it it that it's required somehow for the self understanding of Rwandans in Kigali, right? Or that Yad Vashem can appropriate other genocides, or that that Bosnia you had to have photos that resembled images of you know, um, uh, 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 camps in, 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 in Poland, right? For people to, to think that um, it was, yes, if it's that, then we have to do something, right? It made it, obviously this is American politics too, but it made it much easier for Bill Clinton to order the bombing of Sarajevo, of, of, of uh, Belgrade um, because of those images. So um, I, I agree with you completely, but in fact, I think we're not so different. I mean, I think our comments are not, because I, I do think that, 
the Holocaust, the globalization of the Holocaust is, is Western in origin. Now, when I talk about Western, I don't necessarily mean the Soviet Union, and but yes and no, it's because after 19, after the 1990s with human rights, that's when the Holocaust really becomes universalized because you now have a regime in which genocide is recognized, the Soviet Union falls there, the gulags, everybody, you know, the gulags are now recognized. Yeah, that, but that, that's, and the, the books I cited all talk about Hiroshima, the gulags, and the Holocaust. So I only focused on the Holocaust, but one of the points was that the, the recognition of the survivor as a, as a member, I, I think I mentioned ecological catastrophe, it's a generic term for every catastrophe, so it gets lit, it gets... Isn't it, isn't it, I'm, I'm confused Sorry. now on your discussion, to be honest, because on one side I hear that the Holocaust is a success story, and the other side, uh, the question is whether doesn't this success story block other um, genocides to kind of um, develop our own history because they, what you say is they, it's globalized and they have to follow certain patterns and they don't allow anything else um, to be told. Yeah, no, I Which understand. I Yes, I agree with that. I just don't think that I just don't know who the they are. That's, and that's what I think the difficulty is, is that it's very hard to pin these down because they're symbolic, real, right? They're, they're performative, they're symbolic. They're not things you can, you know, when, when you, you said, you know, it's an interesting method or something, but you can't touch these things very easily. So it's, you have to, that's why I said it's a difficult <clears throat> methodologically to do be, because it, it's, uh, but the cultural history and an intellectual history, because you, you can't, um, um, because if you read the trial and you try to offer a reading of the symbol, somebody's going to say, well, you know, that's not sufficient because you didn't deal with these rhetorical tropes and this, but if you give them all the context, the, his, the historians will, I mean, if you don't give them context, all the historians will say, where's the context? So you can't ever get it quite right, but... So, but, you're absolute, but you need to do both, absolutely. And, and you need to be clear. So I guess what I'm saying is you're, you're right, but if you look at the symbolic dimension, instead of saying, okay, who's causing this, which is the historian's point of view, right? What is the cause and what's the effect? Absolutely. And you have to somehow answer that, right? It's kind of hard, usually most people fudge it. But, um, but in that sense, it's hard for me to say, who are they, right? Is, are the, the British architects who helped build the museum in Kigali, are they conscious of the Holocaust? Plan? Do they want to block other genocides? Or is this just the way the West has dominated a global understanding and the Holocaust through Western dominance has dominated our understanding of what genocide is? That, and I don't think that's something that is, and, and I, I understand your question, I think, I don't think it's such a conscious process. It's cultural. It's those things we internalize and we imagine that become real. They're no less real for all that, but that's how we understand genocide. And I, what I'm frustrated by is that is that I think the reason for the staying power of the Holocaust, the reason it's traveled like this partly, is because no other victims, all the, the generic victim evoked by the, the, the judges and lawyers on the criminal court in, in, in The Hague has no historical context. There's no incident. It's just a generalized victim. And so that's why I think the Holocaust is the only, that's why I argued about the moral consensus, because the Holocaust is the only genocide around which there has been, a, I mean, it's taken a long time, around which there is a coherent narrative, a par you called it a paradigm, a paradigm that's been created with a typical victim, a typical perpetrator, right, regardless of the complexity, that has that around which there's been a moral consensus. So the point was there has been many genocides before and after, right? And if you think of the, now there's the genocide of the, the Kikuyu, the Armenians, the, the Herero in, in Namibia, all of this I mentioned because it's amazing but uh, that we all recognize those and yet there isn't a broad cultural consensus that these were morally outrageous things. Right? In fact, in France, you have a political party saying we've apologized too much, right? Just, I mean, this is happening all over, right? So, so I'm just saying it's very interesting. So for what, and I think the Eichmann trial and the aftermath, 
were part of the historical process by which, by which the Holocaust became, for, with all the fragility of that consensus, with all the denial, the fact that there are Holocaust denialists, it became a kind of stand-in for a moral consensus about a certain kind of violence, right? And that doesn't exist about any other crime, partly for racist reasons. A lot of it has to do with colonialism, and a lot of it has to do with when the trials occurred in Cambodia, so much, 25 years after the genocide, and it happened in Cambodia, but Western judges from an international criminal court, and half the perpetrators were dead. You know, it just, so again, that's, so that's one of the, I'm glad you brought that out because that's one of the interesting dimensions of this is how is it that the Holocaust became so predominant short of making arguments about Jewish lobbies and, and you know, people trying to block the memories of other people, which is sort of a lot of the discourse, if that makes sense. I'm going to block now the discussion. <laughs> It's clearly identifiable. Uh, mm. Thank you very much, especially thank you. for this inspiring discussion. Oh, yeah. Thank, you very, thank much. you very much for sticking around and speaking. My gosh. Um, you guys are not easy. <laughs> Three part questions. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much again. Uh, ich möchte Sie auf Deutschland noch auf zwei Möglichkeiten aufmerksam machen wieder mal das Wiener Wiesenthal-Institut von Ihnen zu betrachten, weil wir etwas schwer zugänglich sind. Am Freitag, den 8. Juni von 14 bis 18 Uhr werden wir am Internationalen Tag der Archive ein kleines Programm haben. Sie können wieder das Simon Wiesenthal-Archiv, das, das Archiv des Hauses sehen. Wir werden auch Sie durchs Museum wiederführen. Das ist die eine Möglichkeit und die andere ist ein wissenschaftlicher Vortrag von einem unserer Fellows, von Michael Schwarz im Rahmen äh, des Fellow-Kolloquiums. Das findet am 13. Juni statt, um 15 Uhr, im Haus, in der Research Lounge. Und der Titel seines Vortrages wird sein, dass der Jude unser größter Feind ist. Darüber sind wir uns alle klar. Die Karpatendeutschen und die Anteil am Holocaust in der Slowakei. Die nächste Simon Wiesenthal Lecture findet ähm, im November erst statt. Ich weiß sogar das Datum, am 6. November. Es wird Johann Dieter Steiner sprechen, über Kinder, die, also jüdische Kinder, die Zwangsarbeit verrichten mussten. Er ist von der University of Wolverhampton und war ebenfalls äh, Research for Senior Fellow am Wiener Wiesenthal-Institut für Holocaust-Studien. Vielen Dank und wir sehen uns eventuell bei diesen Tagen im Haus oder im November wieder hier. Vielen Dank fürs Kommen. Thank you again.